1998 saw the release of Star Trek Insurrection. After the success of the preceding First Contact, Insurrection was largely seen as a disappointment, receiving a mixed critical and fan response, as well as falling short of box office expectations. As the 90s drew to a close, the Star Trek franchise in general seemed to be winding down, and it was thought that the next big screen outing had to do something radical. <laughs> Following the release of Star Trek Insurrection, another Star Trek feature film wasn't immediately greenlit, as had often been the case with previous entries. Despite the recent highs of the hit First Contact, strong critical reception to Deep Space Nine, and solid ratings for Voyager which had turned into UPN's flagship show, there was a sense of franchise fatigue slowly creeping in. The Next Generation, easily the most successful of the Star Trek shows at the time and definitive to much of pop culture, had left television screens many years before. By 2001, both Deep Space Nine and Voyager had reached the end of their runs, and the big screen installments were still quite hit and miss. Despite these problems though, the higher ups at Paramount still saw Star Trek as their crown jewel property, and felt there was still a strong enough audience out there for more adventures. However, they also felt the need to shake up the formula and make a real splash with the next movie. Once again they tasked Rick Berman with producing the next Star Trek movie, but it didn't take long until Paramount's desire for a radical shakeup of Star Trek clashed with the producer's own ideas. In initial meetings, Berman was shocked when one executive suggested retiring the Next Generation crew altogether and introducing a new cast of characters to take over the Enterprise. According to Berman, he had to fight tooth and nail for one more adventure with the TNG crew, but the studio believed the cast were now too old and audiences were no longer interested in seeing these characters on the big screen. Meanwhile in New York, Brent Spiner was starring in a Broadway revival of 1776, where he met screenwriter John Logan, whose script for Ridley Scott's epic Gladiator would earn him an Oscar nomination the following year. Through casual conversation, Spiner discovered Logan was an enormous Star Trek fan, and so Spiner quickly introduced Logan to Berman, and the three began working on a pitch for what would be the 10th Star Trek movie. Perhaps taking a cue from Berman's own idea for a duplicate Picard story, which he proposed during development of Insurrection, Logan and Spiner came up with the idea of Captain Picard going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a younger clone of himself. Because of Paramount's uncertainty regarding the future of the franchise, the creatives formed a story which could potentially serve as a final adventure for the TNG crew. Picard confronting his young self would facilitate themes of moving on from the past and the breakup of family. The three of them took the pitch to Patrick Stewart, who loved the concept. All four of them then pitched the story to Paramount, and it was then the studio was convinced to give the TNG crew at least one more movie, with a possible follow-up if this tenth installment was a success. John Logan quickly went about crafting his script, which would later be titled Star Trek Nemesis. He took on notes from Spiner, Berman, and Stewart. In Logan's script, he came up with a Romulan political plot, which would see a young clone of Picard, created for an abandoned espionage mission, take control of the Romulan Empire via a coup with the assistance of the enslaved Remans. Implementing one of the story notes also conjured the character of B4, a less advanced positronic android, which Data would attempt to take under his wing. Also during the development of the script, it was decided to kill off Data. Brent Spiner had felt for quite some time that he had aged out of the character, visibly getting older when he was meant to be playing an ageless android. With a script featuring Picard being pitted against an arch enemy, the death of a fan favourite character, and themes of growing older and moving on, it's no surprise that Rick Berman approached Wrath of Khan writer-director Nicholas Meyer to helm the film. Jonathan Frakes had previously directed First Contact and Insurrection and had years of experience directing episodes of TNG, DS9 and Voyager. According to Frakes, after his debut directing First Contact, he was told by many industry higher-ups that essentially the world was his oyster and he'd no doubt be fielding offers from more and more big franchise movies. However, after the release of Insurrection, he was simply told, you're just a TV director. He has said since that if he was offered the director's chair for Nemesis, he would have said yes. 
When Berman approached Nicholas Meyer, he was interested in taking up the reins, but would only take the job if he could completely rewrite the script. Berman had already promised John Logan he would have full control over the script, and so Meyer was unable to take the job. Berman then suggested LeVar Burton be given a shot at the director's chair, since, like Freaks, Burton had spent years directing numerous episodes of the various shows. Paramount, however, was insistent on Stuart Baird directing the film. At the time, Baird was mostly known as an acclaimed editor rather than a director, having been nominated for Academy Awards for his work on Superman the Movie and Gorillas in the Mist. Before Nemesis, he had directed the hit Executive Decision and the thriller US Marshals. For whatever reason, Paramount was determined to have Baird direct Star Trek Nemesis, perhaps seeing him as a hot commodity at the time. Baird, though, was not at all familiar with Star Trek, only having the vaguest possible awareness of the franchise. Initially, he turned down Paramount's offer for this reason, but they asked him several more times, prompting him to research Star Trek. Once he did, he saw potential in helming the next movie, and eventually accepted the job after some persuading. Having received praise for the tense action scenes in his previous movies, Baird sought to inject more action into the script, adding in the desert car chase and extending several firefights. He also requested the Enterprise E bridge set be altered so it rested on gimbals, so the set could tip and shake for real as opposed to the traditional camera shaking technique. In Logan's original script, the final space battle would have been between an entire fleet of starships and the villain's own prototype ship, the Warbird Scimitar. However, due to budgetary constraints, this was scaled back in the end. For the all-important role of Shinzon, the younger clone of Picard, many actors were considered, including Jude Law, before the relatively unknown Tom Hardy landed the role. To make Hardy resemble Patrick Stewart more closely, the film's makeup team added a prosthetic nose and chin. Shinzon's confidant, the Riemann Viceroy, was played by Ron Perlman in heavy makeup, which the actor was used to following Beauty and the Beast. For the Riemanns themselves, Logan and Baird were keen on the idea of vampire-like aliens, as they had never seen the sunlight due to being confined to the dark side of their homeworld. Head of makeup Michael Westmore took heavy inspiration from the character Count Orlock from the 1922 film Nosferatu in creating the design. Shinzon's flagship, the Warbird Scimitar, was designed by effects artist John Eaves. Although Patrick Stewart and Brent Spiner were enthused to begin filming, some other cast members went in with a little more apprehension. In more recent years, Marina Sirtis has spoken vocally about the way she was treated when it came to contract negotiations, saying how she had given up smoking some years prior, and what got her started again was contract negotiations with Paramount. Allegedly, they offered her an insultingly low salary, and when Sirtis pointed this out, she was bluntly told, if you don't take the offer, we'll fire you and hire Jerry Ryan. To which Sirtis replied, well, Jerry Ryan won't do it for that money, that's for sure. Jerry Ryan was indeed asked to reprise the role of Seven of Nine for the film, effectively replacing Deanna Troy. However, Ryan was committed to filming Boston Public at the time, and also didn't think it made much sense to have Seven team up with characters she barely knew. Later, when Serta successfully managed to negotiate her way back into the film, Ryan was again approached for a cameo appearance at Riker and Troy's wedding. However, Ryan said Seven going to this wedding made even less sense, and so she declined. The cameo role was then given to Kate Mulgrew, who reprises Catherine Janeway in the finished film, having been promoted to an admiral sometime after Voyager's triumphant return to Earth. Another cameo was that of Wesley Crusher, once again played by Will Wheaton. However, this cameo was cut from the final film. With some slight trepidation, principal photography of Star Trek Nemesis commenced. Filming began on the 28th of November in the Mojave Desert for the chase sequence. Patrick Stewart had tremendous fun shooting the scenes, doing an estimated 90% of the driving for the chase. After filming for this sequence was complete, the production returned to Paramount Studios. Throughout filming of the studio-based scenes, tensions rose between director Stuart Baird and several of the cast members. In various interviews and panels since, Marina Sirtis, LeVar Burton, Michael Dorn, and to some extent Jonathan Frakes have each criticised Baird for his lack of knowledge with regards to Star Trek. Although he had researched the franchise, it seemed to many of the cast that he hadn't watched any episodes of The Next Generation and was very unfamiliar with the characters. 
Allegedly, Baird believed Geordie LaForge was an alien, and he also kept getting LeVar Burton's name wrong, calling him Laverne. Other cast members have also said Baird's unfamiliarity with the characters hurt many scenes, as the actors were often directed to play scenes in ways which seemed contrary to their characters. While the PR lines at the time attempted to spin this kind of work atmosphere as collaborative and educational, the awkwardness and volatility of the situation has been discussed at length by several cast and crew since. Many Star Trek fans have often thrown a lot of harsh criticism Baird's way, and to some extent it is warranted. However, I wouldn't say all of it is entirely fair. Baird reportedly did work very well with Patrick Stewart, Brent Spiner, and John Logan, and it's clear he does possess a lot of talent as a filmmaker. I also wouldn't say his unfamiliarity with Star Trek is any kind of a disqualifying factor, as the same was also true of Nicholas Meyer and Harv Bennett, who oversaw arguably the most successful run of Star Trek movies. What's less forgiving though is Baird's unwillingness to watch the next generation and better familiarize himself with the universe and characters. That is, if the stories from the dissatisfied cast are to be believed. Baird himself has also said he found it frustrating to have to work within a pre-established franchise and restrict many of his ideas. The working atmosphere also couldn't have been helped by Jonathan Frakes not being asked back to direct and LeVar Burton not even being given the opportunity. This was a cast who had become very close friends by this point, and for this group to see Frakes and Burton being given the cold shoulder from Paramount in favour of someone they saw as having no business directing a Star Trek movie, it very much rubbed them the wrong way. For the visual effects of the film, once again industrial light and magic were unavailable, and so instead the production enlisted the help of Digital Domain. This was the first Star Trek production in which no full miniatures were built, with the studio instead relying on digital and computer-generated effects. That is, with the exception of the scene where the Enterprise rams the scimitar. For that scene, a miniature of the Enterprise saucer section and the scimitar's hull were constructed. To simulate the weightlessness of space, the collision between the ships was shot upside down, so that when flipped, the debris from the impact would seem to fly upward. For the film's score, Jerry Goldsmith was once again brought in to compose the music, and this suited Baird, who had already worked with Goldsmith on Executive Decision and US Marshals. To reflect the generally darker and more action-driven movie, Goldsmith heavily utilised synthesizers and high strings to supplement the traditional brass and drums of his returning Star Trek music. He created a five-note motif specific to Shinzon, which is used throughout the score in various forms to reflect the different dimensions of the character. When it came down to editing Nemesis, studio interference plagued the production after a poorly received test screening. Huge chunks of the movie were taken out, including Wesley Crusher's cameo and one particularly strong scene in which Picard and Data share a glass of wine and ruminate on family, the passage of time, and the nature of change. Overall, it's estimated that roughly 30 minutes was cut from the film. This was yet another showcase of Paramount's concerns over the demand for more Star Trek and the increasingly prevalent notion that Star Trek was tired and needed a break. Therefore, it seems Paramount wasn't confident in Nemesis as a whole and the creative decisions at an executive level suffered from a too many cooks problem. It's been suggested the severe edits to the film were motivated by the goal of reducing the runtime of the movie enough so that cinemas could put on more showings per day and thus the studio would stand a better chance at getting a return on their investment. However, the detrimental effects this would likely have on the final product should have been obvious. Either way, on the 9th of December 2002, with not quite as much fanfare as one may expect, Star Trek Nemesis was released to the public. Star Trek Nemesis is easily one of the most controversial entries in the franchise, with many fans ranking it near or at the very bottom of their movie ranking lists. It gets a lot of flack for its dark tone, the abundance of action, and overall it's seen as quite an unsatisfying send-off for the Next Generation crew. This was a viewpoint I myself held for quite some time, but after my most recent rewatch and the research I've done for this video, I feel as though I get Nemesis a little more. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not about to say that Star Trek Nemesis is some kind of masterpiece that was merely misunderstood, it's far from one of the best big screen outings, but I also wouldn't say it's necessarily one of the worst. It has some quite serious flaws, and much of the criticism levied at the film is legitimate, but I also feel like it has some unsung strengths. 
Presentation-wise, this is a terrific looking and sounding movie. Despite the difficulty Stuart Baird had behind the scenes, his talents as a director and experience as an editor are clear in the final film. The movie takes on a highly cinematic, epic feeling with a brisk pace and plenty of engaging action. Digital Domain's work is very strong throughout. While there are a handful of shots which seem very rushed, the majority of the work looks stunning. As opposed to the plastic looking ships seen in Insurrection, in Nemesis the effects are a lot more convincing. Convincing. There's also a grand sense of scope to the shots, which turns even the most by-the-numbers establishing shots into true eye candy. Similarly, Jerry Goldsmith created yet another great score, in fact I'd say it's one of his best Star Trek scores ever. While his work on Insurrection made great use of sweeping symphony, serene high strings and pastoral woodwinds, Nemesis goes in the opposite direction with heavy reliance on brass, percussion and synthesizers. This lends the Nemesis score a lot of texture and depth. Shinzon's five-note motif is incredibly versatile. Simply by switching instruments and tempo, it seamlessly goes through heroic, poignant, villainous, tragic, a whole range of emotion. The music composed for the final battle is some of the best action music Goldsmith has ever created. An outstanding score even amongst Goldsmith's great body of work. Where Nemesis starts to run into trouble though is with its storytelling and character development. The cut material really damages the final film, and there are also a number of scenes which, as far as I'm concerned, shouldn't have been in the movie to begin with. Things start out strong, with the murder of the Romulan Senate establishing the darker tone, and the following wedding scene reintroducing the familiar cast, with some wonderful dialogue and setting up the themes of change and family going their separate ways. It's just a real shame the aforementioned scene of Data and Picard ruminating on these ideas was removed. The discovery of B4, trip to Romulus and meeting Shinzon is again all good for the most part. Tom Hardy's performance as Shinzon is exceptional. It's no wonder he went on to have the career he did because his talents are obvious even from underneath the Patrick Stewart lookalike makeup. The dialogue he shares with Picard is very interesting, and the Remans are a fresh addition to the Romulan Empire. Their vampiric appearance is really creepy, and their plight is largely sympathetic. However, immediately after this scene between Shenzhen and Picard is where Nemesis starts to stumble, with the introduction of a planet-killing superweapon, more drawn-out action, but especially egregious is when Shinzon, with the help of his Viceroy, telepathically assaults Deanna Troy. It's a needlessly dark and disturbing scene which serves absolutely no purpose. If it was part of some larger character arc or setting up a subplot, it would still be distasteful, but there would at least be a reason for it. As it exists in the final film, it comes across as totally tactless and cruel. What also hurts the film is the lack of material for the rest of the regular cast. Picard, Data and Shinzon are given the most focus, and there are some scenes dedicated to Riker and Troy, but Dr. Crusher, Geordi and Worf in particular have nothing to do whatsoever. A lot of what they were given sadly ended up on the cutting room floor, but this feels like a symptom of the movie not being sure if it's meant to be the final adventure for the TNG crew. In The Undiscovered Country, that film made sure to give each of the regular cast some kind of last hurrah before they rode off into the sunset. And while in Nemesis, Riker and Troy get something of a send-off, the rest of the crew are mostly relegated to espousing Technobabble. This ends up hurting the final act where Data sacrifices himself to rescue Picard and destroy the Scimitar. While it does work emotionally in the moment, I've always felt like the fallout of Data's death isn't as well handled. For example, Geordi was Data's best friend, and yet I don't think he has a single line of dialogue after this scene. I also feel like the fate of B4 could have been made a bit clearer. Many viewers come away from the film thinking Data has somehow been resurrected within B4, but after my latest rewatch, I realise that's not actually what's supposed to have happened. B4 singing Blue Skies isn't meant to signal Data's resurrection, but B4 finally unlocking his potential to evolve into a more complex person. This is meant to tie in with the personal conflict between Shinzon and Picard, as Shinzon believes he can't fight what he is, while Picard insists he has the capacity to grow and choose his own destiny. If the theme of change was intact within the final cut of the film, this would have completed a brilliant exploration of this idea, but as it is in the final cut, B4 is basically shafted as a character, which I think is a shame. Criticism has also been levied at the action in the movie, and I can see why. While there is nothing wrong with featuring action in Star Trek, the franchise did begin as a sci-fi action-adventure show after all, 
Nemesis becomes a little overstuffed considering the length of the final battle. The clash between the Enterprise and the Scimitar in the Basin Rift is about 30 minutes long. Now as I discussed in this short video which you can find via my Patreon or members, this sequence is pretty damn awesome. It's well paced, has multiple smaller conflicts within, with shifting and escalating goals and obstacles, it's really great stuff. But I feel like this sequence alone has more than enough action for the entire movie. The car chase after finding B4 feels very tacked on, and Picard's escape from the Scimitar could have certainly been trimmed. By the time we get to this grand finale, the movie risks exhausting the audience with too much action after these earlier unnecessary action beats. I do feel like at one point the filmmakers had a potentially great movie on their hands, but due to studio interference forcing scenes to be cut and a director prioritising the wrong things to take out, Nemesis doesn't hit its stride the way it should. The story doesn't breathe, many of the characters are sidelined, and the interesting narrative themes aren't explored in enough depth. I think a re-edit of the film to scale back the earlier action scenes and put those character moments back in would improve the movie, not fix it outright, but it could be made stronger using the existing footage. As it stands, Star Trek Nemesis is a decent enough sci-fi action flick which features some great performances and touches on some rich ideas, but it misses the mark quite wide in the end. I don't think it's the atrocity many fans make it out to be, and I certainly found more enjoyment during my latest rewatch, but it's a shame this era of Star Trek didn't end on the high it should have. In keeping with the hesitant development and at times rough shooting days, Star Trek Nemesis struggled upon release. Critics gave it a mixed to negative response, with praise being given to the action, but criticisms levied at the character development, plotting and dark tone. Fan opinion was decidedly negative, with many seeing it as a weak send-off to the Next Generation cast. Box office wise, Nemesis performed even worse. It was the first Star Trek film ever to not debut at number one during its opening weekend. It faced fierce competition from Harry Potter in the Chamber of Secrets, Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, and Die Another Day. In the end, Nemesis grossed $67 million worldwide on a budget of $60 million, making it a financial bomb. During post-production of Nemesis, Brent Spiner and John Logan had actually begun work on a follow-up film if Nemesis was a success. The outline of the idea would have seen the Next Generation crew crossing over with both the Voyager and Deep Space Nine cast, would have featured Riker and Troy commanding the USS Titan, and would possibly have resurrected Data. I have to say, this sounds like a much more satisfying way to close the book on the Next Generation cast, but who knows how it may have turned out. In the end though, Nemesis flopping scuppered any hopes of another TNG era movie. It was the worst received Star Trek movie since The Final Frontier, but at least Star Trek was still finding success on the small screen when that movie came out. The same unfortunately cannot be said for Star Trek on television following Nemesis. <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my patrons or my YouTube members where you can see videos early as well as some other exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.